The 17-year drought is over. All hail the Kings. Mm. Sydney, the NBL 22 champions. 3-0 sweep of the Jack Jumpers. They win it 97 to 88. Hello and welcome to Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle and we've now got the NBL Championship decided for the 2021-22 season. The Sydney Kings proved to be too good in the end. A valiant effort from the Tasmania Jack Jumpers, but I think everyone will agree that the Sydney Kings ended up being the deserved championship winners. We've got a lot to talk about on this week's show. We'll be wrapping up all of the NBL 22 season. We'll announce the winner of our Galen Award as the best NBL team man, thanks to the votes of our listeners. We'll catch up with the man up north, Alex Loughton, who we are very proud to say that we had a big say in getting him on our TV <laughs> screens, Cody. We'll talk about the NBL free agency. We'll have a look, a quick look already at NBL 23. We'll talk to Cody about what's happening in the NBL 1 West competition. He's fresh off a trip to Kalgoorlie as of this week and got a double-headed to look forward to. So plenty to get through on this week's show. I'm Chris Pike, the co-host, but the man that you've all tuned in to hear from, the Warwick Senators captain, the former Illawarra Hawks and Sydney Kings forward, Cody Ellis. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, man. Good to be here. Um, look, I think, uh, you know, obviously Kings getting it done in three games was uh, disappointing because we would have liked some more basketball. But uh, I think that also proved that you can have a really good series with one team just winning every game. Yeah. Um, so, look, yeah, um, Jack Jumpers just fell short, just had those bodies fall late and, uh, yeah, is what it is. And uh, Kings, Kings definitely deserved it, I think. Yeah, I think so too. I think I don't think you'll find anyone that won't now admit that they're probably the best team of yeah. this NBL season. So we'll, we'll get into detail on that grand final series as we go along on this week's show, Cody. Of course, we're, th- we're here thanks to Hoop7. You can check them out at hoop7.com. .au, um, anywhere from within the country, or if you are in Perth, head to their store on Murray Street. Cody, have you been able to check it out just yet? And when you do, you bump into Tevin Jackson, one of your NBA One opponents, and mm-hmm. he probably doesn't give you much of a discount, does he? No, 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 no. No, it's always good to jump in there and uh, and, and catch up with all the boys. Um, again, good to, good to see Jace in there, uh, have a chat to him. Um, and then, yeah. You know, like you said, Tev, um, always good to catch up with him and talk some ball. And, um, oh, yeah, whenever I go in there, I, I usually try not bring the misses because I'm usually in there talking basketball for about an hour and a half. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. A- any type of shoes you need, they'll take care of. Has Chase got you buying him basketball shoes just yet? Absolutely. I think <laughs> he's got more shoes than me and that's wow. saying something. <laughs> all right, so Hoop7 will take care of all your needs there. Um, a lot to get through on this week's show, Cody. Looking forward to catching up with Alex Loudon. I think this will be your first time to catch up with him. Um, you battled with him for a number of years um, in the NBL. You were both four men that, mm-hmm. that battled, battled bodies and you even spent a little bit of time up in Cairns where he was the captain at the time. Mm-hmm. What might you be looking forward to having a chat to, to Lowes about? Oh, it'd just be good to catch up. You know, I haven't spoke to Lowes since I was, uh, yeah, up there in Cairns for that week, uh, helping him out and, and training with him and, and playing those uh, pre-season games. But, yeah, look, battled against him for, for my, you know, whole NBL career and uh, it was always fun to go up against him. You know, one of those guys that could stretch the floor and, and it was always a tough guard. And was, was one of those guys that could get the crowd into a game uh, very easily. Um, so... <laughs> No, it'd be good to catch up with him. Very similar type of player to you. I mean, if you look at the type of... If you would describe yourselves as four men, Mm -hmm. very similar characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Kind of that pick-and-pop guy. Um, He was was a little bit taller than I was. Um, You kind of had to close out on on us in that three-point line, which was good. Could always uh, stretch the floor. And, um, yeah, it it was definitely like trying to play yourself. I take a lot of pride in the fact that we helped get Laos onto our TV screens. I mean, we've talked a little bit about it. How happy were you that we finally helped to, to make that happen? Oh, it was great. It was, uh, yeah, no, it was good having a hand in it. Um, <laughs> and, no, look, I think that uh, every game needs that, uh, that X player, someone that's, that's been through that system fairly recently because mm-hmm. um, I think they just give you a different perspective. And, um, you know, the basketball community is so tight-knit 
that uh, you get to catch up with ex teammates, mm. ex com- competitors, and um, it's 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 good. It's really good, and um, I think I think he was great. It was good to listen to. Yeah, I agree. And we'll talk to Lau shortly on the show. But let's get to the grand final series, Cody. Um, it ended up going only to three games, but mm. I think all three games were very entertaining. Yeah. The Jack Jumpers certainly put up a fight. The Kings never blew them out of the water at, at any point. Um, all three games could have could have gone either way, really, mm-hmm. from sort of halfway through the, the fourth quarter. Um, so we'll start at game one. The Sydney Kings won at home 95-78. to 78. Game two down in Hobart, the Kings won again 90-86 to 86 on the back of that huge DJ Vasilovic three-pointer. And then game three, the Jack Jumpers were on top for a lot of this game. They just couldn't quite keep it going. They fought, mm-hmm. fought valiantly, but in the end, the absence of Fab Krislovic and Jack McVeigh, as we'll talk about, Proved pr- pretty pivotal in the Kings. Wrapped up the championship 97 to 88 in front of a grand final record NBL crowd of 16,149 people. Um, we'll go into it in, into, in a bit more depth, but what's your overall sort of feeling about the series, Cody? Uh, and look, like I, like I said in the intro, I think that this kind of proved that you can have a one sided series, but it'd still be a really good mm. series. And I think we saw that in the, the Hawks and um, Kings series yeah, sure. as well in the semifinals. You know, Kings win both those games, both games really good. Look, I think once once Adams went down in that in that first game, I thought Tassie were a real chance. And they were. They were right there in both those games. DJ's DJ's three in that game too was huge. And just just timely, you know. I, th- I think it was uh, a, a massive shot, biggest shot of his career so far. Um, Made for that moment too, wasn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He is built for it. that, absolutely. And he's going to have plenty of those yep. uh, big shots uh, in, in his career to come. Um, and then, yeah, look, game three, frustrating not having not having Fab or, or McVeigh yep. in there. And, and it showed um, just on the boards. Yeah, yeah. That that was it, you know. I think that's where the game was was lost for for them. And you know, you've got three of your biggest guys out, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you you get Jarrell Martin going off. Yeah. You get you get Zave going yeah. off, and yeah, it, it was frustrating. But they look, they were still right there. I think they still fought hard, and they made Sydney earn it, and uh, and they certainly did. Yeah, I think you made you made the point. I mean, the difference in the end was Xavier Cooks and Jarrell Martin in that front court. And they're already without Will Magnate, but then to not have your two starting front court members, your starting five man Fab, who is already giving up a lot of size already, and Jack McVeigh, who's had an outstanding season, yeah. unfortunately meant that they didn't get a real crack at it. I mean, if you add Magnate, McVeigh, and Chris Lubick into that game three team, we might still have a series that's going right now. Yeah, I think so. I think you're probably right. Um, you know, obviously. You don't want to see anyone injured, and it sucks that we couldn't get to see the MVP yeah, um, yeah. throughout the whole series. But I think it just proved how how deep that Kings team was. Mm-hmm. You know that they could do it in three games w- without the most valuable player in the league. And yeah, look, I, I think you're right. I think we Tassie probably steal one or two of those those games if they if they have their bigs in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, look, frustrating, but the Kings definitely uh, deserve to win it, and uh, I think they they certainly proved that that they were the team of the league. In that game three, you you were there in some of those darker days for the Kings, where yep. Kudos Bank <laughs> Arena was pretty much atmosphereless. Yes, that, that you could hit, almost hear a pin drop, and you'd probably be lucky to get five thousand people to a game there yeah. for for a little while. Um, Grand final record, 16,000 people there for game three on a Wednesday night, Yeah, um, in the, almost in, in winter. Mm-hmm. Um, how much did that warm your heart? Oh, it was awesome. It was really good to see. And that's um, that's with another 3,500 on top of game one. Yeah. Um, so, no, that's awesome. I, I think for the NBL to be at its peak, I think teams like Sydney need mm-hmm. to be relevant. I think the, the crowd needs to be there and, you know, 16,000 to a game mm-hmm. is unreal. You know, obviously you got the standard of the league with Perth mm-hmm. who get, you know, 13, 14 to every single game. I think Sydney is is in the hunt for that now. You know, I think if they can keep this exciting core together and um, hopefully they do, then I think, you know, the Kings faithful will uh, will be out in force. And, yeah, I mean, that place uh, gets very loud, <laughs> very loud. No, they, they, had a, they had a great season. I mean, they supported that team all season long. And yes. some of those... I remember how nuts the place went when they stole that game against the Brooklyn Bullets mm-hmm. with that Jalen Adams dunk and then the, the, the 
offensive rebound on the on the on the missed free throw. I mean, they really got behind this team, and I think it's because of the way you know the team played and the energy they brought. Um, Xavier Cooks was a massive part of mm-hmm. it as well. Um, I think he was clearly the grand final MVP. There was no surprise when he was announced winning winning that. Um, across the three games, he had fifty seven points, thirty five rebounds, sixteen assists. It felt like he didn't shoot the ball that great at times, but he still went twenty of thirty three from the field. Got to the foul line 22 times. It was a pretty impressive performance. Oh, it was. Just a monster. Doing what he's been doing all season. I think, uh, you know, like we mentioned, it, it probably took him a, a two or three games to get back into his rhythm after he was hurt. But, you know, come playoffs, he, he'd hit his stride again and he was pretty much back to where he was before that injury. Yeah, look, just a, just a monster of a, of a grand final series and had to with, with Adams out. You know, had to be that guy, and uh, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, if he got some NBA look-ins after mm. after what he produced. Jerome Martin as well came up yeah. came up huge, and across those three games, forty nine points, thirty four rebounds, and he shot the ball, you know, brilliant. Unreal. Twenty of twenty seven overall, yeah. six of ten from three. I think it was in game three he, he knocked out four threes as well, yeah. and and was a, a massive part in wrapping up the championship and. He, <laughs> He probably did what the Jack Jumpers needed one of their bigs to do who were missing, but he made the most of, of his chances. Oh, he did. He did. And he, he was awesome for him all season. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I said at the very start of the season, you know, with him in shape, he would be in MVP contention. And uh, obviously with, with the different guys on his team, he, yeah. he was kind of the third peg. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think he had, again, a, a bit of an underrated season mm-hmm. and then... Just, just a beast inside, and just, just kind of ate Tazzy alive in that in that third game. And I mean, that's your five man stretching the floor and, and knocking down triples, and you know he's tough to stop. He's an absolute bull down low, mm-hmm. and um, just has that really good touch. And I think uh, Zave was unreal. You know, he was hands down Finals MVP. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, I think Martin was was certainly nipping at the heels. How much fun was it to see? Basketball these days is becoming more and more of an outside game and yep. you're seeing more of the athletes take over. But seeing two bulls like Gerald Martin and Mikhail McIntosh bang bodies and get physical and mix it up with each other, that was a lot of fun to watch for me. Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, you know, that needs to be part of basketball. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, I'm all for, you know, the, the direction that basketball is going with, with that outside mm-hmm. game. But I still think you need that bull inside. And, you know... It's one of those places where you can get a good hit and um, play through that. And for the most part, you know, the refs let you play down low, uh, a bit more physical yeah. than, than on the perimeter, which is good because you've got two big, strong bodies going at each other. That It's, it's fun to watch as well. Um, yeah, no, I, I was, it was really good, really good to see. How did the Kings manage to overcome the loss of the MVP? Um, well, Lowes will talk a little bit about Sean Bruce shortly because they he's one of one of Lowes' favourite teammates that he had from that grand final run that they had up in up in Cairns. But I think one of the great underrated things of this championship will be the way that Sean Bruce came in and ran the team and mm-hmm. got them into their offense over those last two games. Oh, absolutely. He was um he was awesome and he was he was pivotal. I think that uh, you know, once once Adams went down that that opportunity was there and, you know, Brucey has done that his whole career. He's kind of grabbed that opportunity and run with it. Um, you know, he was he was one of those guys that was that was out of the league for a little bit, and you know, got that opportunity um, up in Cairns, and and again, just ran with it. Um, yeah, so fifteen assists in those last two yeah, grand final games, and wouldn't have had too many turnovers with it. Yeah. It would have only been two, three at the most, I reckon. Yeah. Um, and yeah, look, just just was awesome, uh, and it was really good to see. A guy that has, has fought his way uh, into a roster spot and uh, produced on the, on the biggest stage. The other thing that proved a masterstroke was being able to bring in Ian Clark mid-season and then having him to to become a leader on the team when Jalen went down as well. And um, especially in the second half of that game three, he just showed all of his class and, and experience. Oh, he did. He did. That was always a massive signing. Um, you know, as soon as Sydney brought Ian in. I definitely thought that they were a, a contender straight away. You know, he, he came out in that first game uh, and, and lit it up and then probably had a couple quiet games by his standards, um, just getting used to the league. Yeah. But, 
I mean, once he got used to it and, and figured out the ins and outs and how it's refed and, and uh, how it's played, um, he was he was huge for them. And just timely shots, just constant timely well, shots. In that game three, he hadn't scored up until he hit that buzzer beater just before half time. Yep. Then he ends the game hitting five threes and 22 points. And yep. And that's when the big guns stand up, when, when it matters most. I said that. As soon as he hit that, I went, <laughs> uh-oh. I did. I, I was sitting there watching it with Dad, and uh, I, I said straight away, I said, that's not good for Tazzy. Mm-hmm. I said he just got wide open look, sees one go through the hoop. As a shooter, it's all you need. Yeah. And as a shooter of his capacity, it's, it's more, than, <laughs> more than you need. So, and it, it proved right because he came out and just – found his rhythm and, uh, and pretty much put him away by himself. You saw firsthand a couple of guys who had really good NBA careers come out and spend some time in Sydney mm-hmm. that didn't necessarily take it that seriously. Yep. For Ian Clark to come, come out, he's won an NBA championship. He could easily rest on his laurels and not take this that mm-hmm. seriously, but he, he, he really fully brought into everything about being part of this Kings team, he wanted to take it seriously to be a leader and to help the group. And it's not easy to find someone that's got that reputation and history but still have that passion for the game. Oh, for sure. Look, I think lots of lots of the old NBA guys that come down here just expect it to be a bit of a walk-in-the-park type yeah. of a league. And it's not. It's not. You've got to come down here and you've got to compete. Um, it's, it's one of the better leagues in the world um, that's not the NBA. And... It's, it's really a um, defensive-minded league. Mm-hmm. You can't just come here and, and just go out and get buckets like yeah. you think. So I think the professionalism that Clark showed was awesome. I'm, I'm pretty sure Chase Buford would have had a word to him being like, look, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not just a walk in the park. You know, you've got to come here and actually play. He hadn't um, played for virtually two years. No, he hadn't. He hadn't. So I think that's awesome. And... With that, he's probably coming in with something to prove. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you take it a bit more serious. Whereas, you know, some of the other guys that have come into the league are just kind of trying to prolong their career a bit. Um, and, oh, he was awesome. He was great. I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that they could get him in. Now, you spent a fair bit of time in Sydney. Um, did you get a bit of... What was your reaction when you saw them win a championship and celebrate? Did, did, you, did you feel happy? What was your reaction? Yeah, no, I was. I was, I was happy for them. You know, it's um, one of those things that when I was there, the club was, like you mentioned, it probably wasn't in a, in a great place. It had a whole bunch of owners um, that, you know, all wanted to put their two cents in. And we, we just couldn't put together a, a good enough roster to, to, get, to get it done. Um, but I think the thing that I enjoyed was the growth of, of the club from where when I was there, to, to now to winning a championship. And I, I think that's really good for the city. Um, like I said, I, I think for the NBL to be at its peak, I think teams like the Kings mm-hmm. need to be relevant. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, look, I was, I was happy. I, I was very happy for them. Oh, fantastic. Um, just touching on the Jack Jumpers, I want to get your thoughts on Josh Adams because he had a, he, he had a good season, mm-hmm. a little bit up and down at times, but... He went, and he went to another level in the playoffs. We saw what he did against Melbourne United in the semifinals, and he had to step up in this grand final series, and he did. I know he had a little bit of a tough start in game one where he only shot four of 18, but mm-hmm. you know, his 36 points in game two were enormous. Some of those shots he hit. Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute. I mean, you, you don't want to make this comparison, but Steph Curry-like yeah. in, 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 yep. in a couple of those shots that he, he hit to almost you know, win that game for the Jack Jumpers, and... Um, across the series, 76 points, and um, I think that game one makes these numbers not stand out as much as they probably would have, but 26 of 60 shooting, 9 of 24 from three. Um, he stamped himself as one of the, the very best players in this league. He did, and the only thing that stopped him was foul trouble, yep. Um, yep. which, especially in the start of game three, really hurt them, I it think. Did, yeah. I think he came out ready to go, ready, um, ready to play, um, he two threes early, didn't he? But then he had those two fouls at the same time. Back-to-back triples and then two real quick fouls yeah. and then had to sit. And that sucks. That, that really sucks to see. Because, uh, yeah, look, I think he probably could have exploded for another 36 yeah. had he have uh, been able to stay on the court a bit longer in that game three. But 
yeah, look, it was a lot of fun to a lot of fun to watch. And you're right, some of those shots he was hitting were just unreal. The way he can you know contort his body in the air is mm-hmm. is very impressive. And you know, it's, I usually study people's shot and mm-hmm. how they shoot and what spots they like to get to. And you know, it doesn't matter where he jumps from; his shoulders are always just dead square to the rim. Mm-hmm. Um, whether his body, his lower half is in the opposite direction, he, his his shoulders are always so square to the rim, and it's um, yeah, it's very impressive how he can get there sometimes. We've talked a lot about the amazing performance of the Jack Jumpers to get to the grand final. How do you reflect back on what they were able to do now that now that it's all done? I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on on what they they did this season? Um, oh, it was amazing. You know, I, I think that uh, they put the club on the map from the get go, and I, I think that's something that Scott Roth wanted to do. Obviously, and that's what you want to do as as a new club coming in. You want to make sure that teams know that you're there. You know, you're not just a walkover. To make a grand final series is is just amazing. I think um, they had going into the season again probably the the least talented squad on paper, but the buy in. And like we've been saying all season, just the the fact that you know it started from the coach and from the coaching staff, and what we could see. I'm sure it started from you know the the admin and everything, sure. um, but you know from what we saw, it started from the coaching staff and the energy they brought to games, and then that just trickled down through the playing group. That was so much fun to watch. It, it was awesome, especially in the second half of the season when they really started clicking. It'd be very interesting to see how they would have gone with uh, with the big fella yeah. inside. It's going to be fascinating how they go next season as well. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about free agency shortly across the league, but they've pretty much got their entire roster locked away yeah. from a local contingent. Their imports aren't locked away. I'd be disappointed, especially if Josh Adams and Josh Majette don't come back now. Yeah, I think they definitely need to get those guys back on board. It wouldn't surprise me if both of them tested free agency. But, you know, I, I think you'd want to go back. Yeah. And then, look, no, McIntosh won't get signed again. Um, I think he was really good for them late in the season. Yeah. I think he really picked his game up. There were some games there that he won it for him, just yeah. just with his hustle and um, with his bully ball. Um, yeah. But look, I, I don't think he gets picked up again. I'm not sure um, they need him as much. No. If Magnate's there as well. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And, you know, you'd... You can't really run him in your four. He can knock down that three, but teams were still backing off yeah. him and, and sitting in the keyway off him. Um, and when you got guys like McVeigh in your four yeah. that can knock down that triple, probably don't really need him in there. So it'll be interesting to see what they do and, and yeah, what direction they go. Okay, Cody, that's the grand final series wrapped up and it, it, I don't think it's going to be a series that any of us forget any time soon just because of the story of the Jack Jumpers, the passion and the quality of the Sydney Kings. But a big part of the show this year here on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle has been the Galen Award, the best team man in the NBL. And each and every week we nominated a winner and in the end it came down to a decision between three men. So this is, the, this is the guy that does all of those little things to help their teams win games. And it was Antonius Cleveland from the Laura Hawks, Shea Lee from Melbourne United, Keanu Pinder from the Cairns Taipans. And we couldn't pick between them, Cody. So we put it out to our listeners here on the show. And we got a good response in our votes. And the results were... Fascinating to get your thoughts on the final results. So Keanu Pinder, 18% of the votes, Cody. Shea Lee from Melbourne United, 38%. And the winner of the inaugural Galen Award is the best NBL team man, Antonius Cleveland of the Aurora Hawks, 44% of the votes. Did they get it right? Oh, look, I like we said um, before we put it out to the listeners, I don't think we could have gone wrong with any three of these guys. Um, if it was you and I that had to pick, mm-hmm. I probably would have lent towards Shea. Mm-hmm. But, again, I think any one of these guys is, is deserving. Obviously, congrats to Antonius Cleveland. Um, he was just a massive reason why the Hawks finished where they did. Without him, they don't make playoffs. Um, 
just all the little stuff. Obviously, you know, he, that high-flying, athletic, um, defensive player, but uh, it was it was definitely a lot of the, the diving on that loose ball yep. and, and getting after it and crashing the boards and, and doing all the dirty work mm-hmm. um, and doing the stuff that doesn't necessarily pop up in the stat sheet. Um, and it's definitely something that all three of these guys did. I have a feeling he's a player that Galen Young would have absolutely loved as yeah. well. He yep. embodied everything that Galen, Galen did. Um, it's a remarkable story for, for Cleveland as well because I would have thought a month or so into the season, there was probably some doubts about him actually mm-hmm. seeing the season out. Yep. By the end of the season, he's won our award here in the Galen Award, but he also was named to the all-first NBL team. Yep. He was named the Damien Martin Trophy winner as the best defensive player in the league and he's probably one of the top five players in the league, in, yeah. in fairness. It was a remarkable way that he found his feet. Oh, it was. And, you know, that's that's what happens with, with some imports is they struggled to start the season because they're just trying to adjust. Yeah. So I think that he, he definitely did finish as a, as a top five player. Mm-hmm. I think he thoroughly deserved to be in that uh, all-NBL team. Deserved Defensive Player of the Year. Um, again, deserved this award. I think that uh, he, he just got better and better each week. Um, and, you know, I think that's that's just part of probably his DNA. And, and you know, um, I'm glad that he stuck around, obviously, because, uh, you know, sometimes you wonder with, with uh, imports that get uh, chopped early. Yeah, absolutely. So congratulations to Antonius Cleveland for winning... The Galen Award here on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. Now, Cody, when we come back, we'll speak to Alex Loudon himself. Sounds good. Can't wait. Okay. A pleasure once again to be joined by Alex Loudon here on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. A big year for Laos. We were... Happy that our campaign paid off to get him on our <laughs> TV screens and glad to see him make the most of it. Laos, how did we find you? Mate, very good, very good. Uh, it was an exciting season. Um, yeah, a lot happened uh, behind the scenes, obviously, and I was able to, to get court side, which is fantastic, uh, and had a lot of fun with that. Uh, but what a ripper of a, of a league, uh, ripper of a year, and, and uh, you know, strong finish by Tassie, but just coming up short in all three games. So at the end of the day, obviously, it's sweet, but I just thought it was uh, a really, really good grand final, you know, approach to the grand final. Uh, and congrats to uh, Sydney Kings, of course, and uh, my boy, Sean Bruce. Mm. So, um, yeah, so lot, lots to like about this year's basketball. I'm here with Cody as well, Lowes, and your first chance to catch up with him here on the show since he's joined me as my... Co-host, you spent plenty of years battling against him. Yeah, look, uh, I, I, I remember playing against Cody and obviously uh, he came over to Cairns for that, that spell as well. And um, uh, yeah, no, just great to see guys around the league uh, now on the podcast as well. Still playing, of course, and following the progress over there at NBL One West. Uh, but yeah, uh, first time I guess catching up with Cody. So great to, great to speak to you, mate. Yeah, man, you too, you too. Look, it was... Uh you know, like Chris said earlier, it was uh, it was good to finally see you late in the season uh, on the TV screens and and talking ball for uh, for Cairns. Because uh, look, I, I don't know why they didn't ask you earlier. <laughs> no, well, I mean I, I always put my hand up. Um, you know, just a bit of a timing thing. But yeah, just just really excited, obviously, to, to land it and um, hopefully give a bit of insights. And yeah, it was fun. It was different. Like at the start, I definitely was nervous, but I think I kind of settled into it by the end of it. No, you absolutely did. But uh, no, it's a lot of fun seeing uh, guys that have just come out of the league on, on the screens and talking ball just because, I mean, especially seeing as you know, you know, most of those guys on Cairns and, and even guys like Oscar Foreman at the Hawks still involved with, with the clubs. And um, I think it's awesome to see. And you see the players rotate around as well, like former teammates have moved to different teams yep. uh, and some are coaches, Daniel Kickett, you know, all those kind of guys. Even Kevin Leach, even though we weren't teammates, we had a good chat before uh, the Kings game uh, when they're up here and he's like, oh, how you doing? You know, so it's kind of, it's pretty cool. Like you catch up with guys that you had respect for back in the league uh, and now they're, they're, they're coaching the younger guys coming through. So um, and it's pretty good. And to have former players, I think, just adds a bit of richness to um, the, the commentary because uh, they see different things than the general public kind of guys. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I think it was a, it was a, it was a bit of fun and, and uh, certainly looking forward to hopefully next year. Yeah, for sure. I, I don't think uh, the general public quite understand how close-knit the basketball community is, especially in the NBL. You know, all they see is, is us going at each other on the courts and then uh, 
don't see that, you know, happy to catch up after games and, and we're all, all, all friendly with each other. So, uh, no, it's, it's really good to see, man. And I think even even with COVID, when it was uh, the, the biggest gaps in between games, you, you really realise how much you missed that camaraderie yeah. off the floor. And uh, even Monday Night Hoops, uh, when, when it came back on, everyone's playing again, it was just a sense of relief. So it, it, is, a, it is a tight-knit community. Uh, and everyone just kind of just kind of has an eye out for each other um, and, and enjoys the successes. And, and as, you know, Hoops wins in the end, uh, great basketball has played, uh, you know, in this year and uh, just great to see. Who is the one former player or opponent that you enjoy catching up with the most, Laos? Oh, it's funny because, well, I was torn in this grand final because I had Sean Roos on one side and I had Jared Weeks and uh, Donald and Chris Levick on the other side mm-hmm. of the Tasmania Jack Jumper. So all former teammates of mine and, and different stages of their careers um, when, when they were playing with myself. Um, but sort of Weeksy and Brucey were kind of my boys, so I was kind of happy for whoever won. I was just hoping it was going to get to a, a, a five-game yeah. series. I thought Tassie could have just got over the line for some of those just to make it a bit more spicy but um uh you know congrats obviously to brucey who's now uh, living the high life uh, in <laughs> yeah. sydney and enjoying the parades and everything that goes enjoying the spoils uh but no it's great to see those guys because they, they've been working hard and you see them take their hits and you see them still stay relevant and evolve and then they land on a team that goes all the way and then you know they have the success and now they're champions you know, something I could never do on uh, any of my teams, but we got close. Um, but, you know, just great to see that they could have that success and, and just enjoy all the hard work that they put in. You made a big call early in the season when we spoke about everyone felt like Melbourne United was the championship favourite. You talked about how their age might end up being a factor if they had to play a lot of games in quick succession. Did you kind of feel like that might have playing out a little bit in the end? I, I do recall mentioning a dad's uh, <laughs> Melbourne United uh, dad's army kind of approach, which uh, you know the game stack that would have would have hindered that. The, but one thing I did notice, especially late in the season, I was looking at the numbers, and Tasmania Jack Jumpers had the highest scores off the bench. So bench production was at twenty seven a game. This is about three games to go, so they were the highest on twenty seven. Melbourne United were second on twenty six. Uh, and Sydney Kings had a very top-heavy kind of um, unit with uh, 19 points off the bench. So I, I just felt like the risk was quite high for Sydney Kings if they were to get, the, which they got the injury in the end, obviously to Jalen Adams. So I just thought, gee, if, I just couldn't believe McVeigh and Chris Levick were injured mm, for that so game brutal. three. I just that was just a gut-wrenching one because I thought, oh, here we go. This Adams is out for at least seven to ten days. It looked like a five mil hamstring tear kind of injury, just a little ping uh, that would have set him back. And if they had their full squad or, or more of the the guys that were performing well, McVeigh especially, you know, Chris Levick, oh, just hurt because they they really got close in game two. I thought, oh, they, they've done it by committee the whole way and started to really see it late season and it was paying off in the finals so just tearing up teams and, and putting them to the sword um, so I just thought oh, just the one regret from the final series is that they just couldn't have their full squad but I mean that's throwing a caution to the wind or it, it was just unlucky really um, but uh, look Tassie really impressed me but yeah Melbourne United you know, just kind of just found a way to clutch the feet from the jaws of victory in terms of how stacked <laughs> they were and all that and Chris Golding obviously going down but yeah. yeah like you said those older bodies sometimes just take a bit longer to recover and who would have thought in the layup line a golden calf just mm, goes unreal. gets a bit of a, a, a niggle and a ping and that sort of sends him out so it's just uh, really unpredictable oh for sure I think um, as soon as I saw that the golding was out I, um, I, I I thought Tassie would get it done actually um, you know Chris has, has always been that guy that can just change a game and turn it on its head uh, just within a couple of possessions, and, and I think that's something that Melbourne probably needed in that in that last game. But as a player, Cody, would you have just gotten more juice? Would you would you have just gone? Oh, hang on a minute! Like, yeah. would that have fired you up even more? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, yeah, no, it was it was uh, it was a very interesting game um, that game three. So look, I, there's there's no way that Melbourne shouldn't have got it done anyway. All credit to Tassie; they just they were all over them, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun to see. Yeah, a hundred percent. Your fist pumping after hitting a three was one of your great trademarks. Did you ever get so under the skin of the opposition fans that you got death threats afterwards? <laughs> death threats. I, I did get a lot of like stares because when you do your fist pump, you're really looking down the line, almost like who am I fist pumping out here on the road? You look at uh, Illawarra. Um, 
there. They've got this guy that sits behind the bench. He just goes off and he's feral. Uh, so anytime you could put a dagger on that, you would, you know, you'd start to direct your uh, your outward displays towards the loudest, most vocal uh, person in the stand. So uh, I never got, uh, I never got this sort of a. Uh, knife across the throat kind of signal back to me but uh, you could tell you're getting under some skin uh, when uh, you know starting to put the game away and you know knock down a big dagger but there's nothing greater than winning on the road you just feel like you've sort of owned the town uh, at least for the night anyway <laughs> while you're celebrating so uh, no it's, it's certainly uh, a lot of fun uh, you know to show the fans that you're excited about uh, making buckets on their on their home floor. Yeah, well, to, to piggyback off that, you guys certainly had a, a fairly loud and crazy fan be- sitting behind uh, the opposition bench for, uh, for the years I was in the league. Um, yeah. it, was, it was always fun trying to listen to timeouts because he'd be in there just <laughs> screaming at us. It was uh, always a lot of fun. He's a funny guy because he hasn't been there for a few years now, but he wears a he would wear a Hawaiian, a Hawaiian shirt, shirt, a mum, yep. um, yeah, the humu- the Mumba Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> His name was John the Yank. He was a, a crazy character. Um, you know, and work, worked out of Cairns, of course, uh, with his business in tourism, but he would love getting to the games. And it, I think you need those characters at the game because fans go, oh, there's that guy again, he's going off at the team. And now the um, and now the, the coach is complaining to the refs about a guy in the stands and now he's done his job. So you just start going, oh, he's gotten under his skin. But yeah, then as the players, as you said, Cody, you're coming in, you're like, bloody hell, this guy's right on my hammer. Like, what yeah. the heck? How do we, how do we avoid it? Like, it's just stuff that you don't, you don't remember going into the game, but then once you're playing the game, you're like, oh, I remember That's this guy. Yep. <laughs> uh, Over in Perth, Simon Devlin was one of the most famous ones of that. Did you ever have any run-ins with him, Laos? Yeah, no. I, well, obviously, uh, he was on my side for yeah. a couple of years there, and then uh, then not on my side. So then he was <laughs> he, he didn't hesitate to give me a bit of stick. So, no, I, I respected that because you, you look at those kind of characters, you go, what? you know what? You're, you're like a, a no one, you know, you're just a fan, right? But you've worked your way into my mind and I know exactly who you are. Yeah. Like, they've, they've done their marketing well. They've really put themselves, their brand forwards of heckling. So they're professional hecklers in a way. So, and I think they get a kick out of it once the players recognise them. So it works both ways. It's a bit of fun. Did he fire Homicide up too much for that, for that game that you had in, and lost in Perth under Connor Henry? Oh, mate, you know, if we almost went through the whole year, we didn't bring up the worst <laughs> memory of the Wildcats. Uh, when John really hits 10 threes on us and then uh, Homicide rips the jersey off, stands up on the uh, the bench and starts waving it around. And I just sort of went, oh, my goodness, this is my last game in Perth. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm going to have to be making a move here. <laughs> but, um, no, but in, in similar tone, it, it's the players, it's the characters that, that, really make uh, the, the game watchable because it uh, just adds that extra layer to everything, you know, and have those colourful characters involved in the game. What's happening in Cairns right now, Laos, with the Taipans? Some good news this week with Keanu Pinder and Bull Kowal re-signing. That just had to happen, didn't it? Oh, it's, a, it's big news and a big... I think it's a big deal. It's a big coup for the club because what you've got is Coach Ford, you know, trying to establish a new identity. Uh, he's only been here a year and, you know, first-year coaches will inherit players that don't necessarily, you know, align with your full uh, philosophies. But, you know, now year two is so important for a brand-new coach to a club. Uh, and this is the this is his first step, signing the two best performers pretty much with, with accolades of Rookie of the Year and most improved uh, for Pinder, of course. So you, you sign out, signing those guys straight up, that's a sign of good things to come. So it, it means that the foundation is starting to be set. It means the fans can get excited. You can start to sell, you know, memberships and things like that and just kind of whets the appetite for what could be. Um, and I think it's exciting. So a uh, great move from the club and uh, great for those guys to want to stay as well, still within free agency, uh, within the, you know, the club's uh, period of uh, not being able to speak to other teams yet because that opens up uh, Friday, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, great to have them signed off uh, and unavailable for the poaching. What are you hearing about both Scotty Machado in his health more than anything and also Tajir McCall, who became a real crowd favourite and, and he, he fell in love with Cairns as a city as well. What are, you, what are you hearing about the potential of either or both of those guys coming back? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, unfortunately for Machado, I mean, this league will reward performance uh, and a lot of big dollars go around for, you know, the point guard position because that's, you know, that's that's the the position for all the teams to really load up on, on your superstar. And, and if, unfortunately, if the performance is not there, then, you know, the, the sponsorship dollars don't come flowing because 
So at nine points a game, he's just going to find it really tough to um, be fought over by other clubs and, and get that uh, market value uh, price that he's achieved for these last two years. Uh, so I don't know what the club's sort of going to do there because you, you're running a risk. Is he is he better? Like, is he um, working through that that injury and get, and recovering? Will he be the same when he comes back at full strength? Like, it's got it's almost a year of proving himself again before he's going to be worth the value that he's asking, uh, and that's purely just how the market works. I mean, Cody knows how it is. You, you perform, then you get rewarded with the contract. If you don't perform, then you you sort of back to the the drawing board or looking for other options. So uh, it's really, really competitive in that point guard, that import base, because everyone is replaceable. Uh, with, with Australian and New Zealand talent, there's, there's a, a limited kind of pool, and you know you know everyone uh, within that pool that has the ability to you know level up. Um, but with imports, there's a, a dime a dozen guys waiting on the wings that have just completed college or had success in Europe. So he's, he's going to face a, a lot of challenges uh, in terms of that recruiting coming back to the club. Uh, look for Tajir McCall. It's a, a different story. A really high performer. He stepped up when times are tough. He delivered when times are tough. He's an energy. Um, energy guy. He's an inspirational guy, inspirational athlete. Um, yeah, just just really high level and so, and a player that other players will follow um, just in terms of him, him leading by example makes other players want to play hard uh, and, and buying into the coach's philosophies as well. Um, you know, it's something that it's a player that you can really build a team around. Um, so you've got to, you got to support that kind of play with other, you know, peripheral players and leaders and things like that. But I think the club would be well placed um, if they were to sign the services of Tajir McCall uh, and get him back for another year because he did love Cairns. He, he loved it. He loved it here in the tropics. Uh, I think he found a really good home. He's known as a defensive kind of player in the G League, but he found an offensive um, threat which really boosts your, your stock a lot better than defense. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing Damien Martin calling me from the other <laughs> other side of Australia there going, oh, so I'm into that. You know, I wish I had an offensive rather than defensive, but uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd be excited to see if the club can make some movement on that one before, well, probably not before free agency because uh, I... He 100% he'd probably test the market um, but it's certainly um, an interesting prospect to, to re-sign a guy that's played so well for this town Yeah for sure and I think it's been a couple years in a row now where Machado's kind of struggled a bit with injuries and especially with imports you see teams kind of just not want to go anywhere near that uh, with guys who are fairly injury prone which is unfortunate because I think he's been really good he's been really good for Cairns uh, up until the you know just recently but yeah, look, McCall, I think, is is certainly someone that you would try sign. Um, yeah. And it was tough because I feel like those two didn't really play too well together. No. And, look, they didn't get a whole lot of time to play together because one was out when the other was usually. But, um, look, I think, especially with, with signing Quall and, and Keanu, I think if they can get McCall back, I think that's a really good energetic defensive core that uh, Forty can, can uh, build around. I think I think you're right. I think the the youth uh, and the less uh, prone to injury kind of approach seems to be um, the, the the style that that a club like Titans with some budget limitations are going to have to they're going to run the lower the risk as, as much as possible. You don't have the luxury to get Machado and also get um, your backup uh, guys like a, like a, a Cleveland and a, you know all these high end kind of guys to to build around them and just nurse. Machado through to full health. We don't have that. You need production right now. You need it this this game. You don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. I can't afford to wait. So they need production for their dollars straight away. Now, Lowes, we've been trying to speculate on the future of Nate Jawai a little bit on this show. We don't have a lot of insight. What can you tell us about the big fella moving forward? Yeah. Look. Yeah, look, I spoke to him before the end of the season. Like, uh, I did ask the question because, um, you know, he's a mate of mine and, and uh, you know, everyone has their own um, way that they want to finish up. Uh, he's still keen to play. Like, I, I knew within myself that I was going to be hanging out the booth and that was a decision that was personal for me. I wanted to be in control of that and not leave it up to the gods of, uh, you know, contracts and things. Um, Nate, Nate's still happy to have a reduced role. He's probably 10 to 13 minutes a game. He's happy to play a five-minute role, a little bit like the Barlow role at Melbourne United. Mm-hmm. So um, he still feels like he's got a lot sort of to give, a lot to offer, um, and happy to be more of that, that coach on the sidelines um, as a player and just they help some of these young guys through, um, you know, their, their young professional career. So he's, uh, yeah, he's certainly not hanging up the boots or making noises like that. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's exciting for, for, for him to, 
you know, come to that conclusion as well. Because like I said, it, it is a personal thing and, and one that players, you can feel it as you get older. You're like, well, getting a bit older, it's like, hang on a minute, what, what do I do? Do I, uh, you know, will I get re-signed? Will I have to make a move? You know, all that kind of thing. So the fact that he's playing, you know, in the NBL one and, and playing for Darwin, salty, something different, you know, something fresh, maybe, you know, trying to find that little bit more energy and, and that kind of thing and just see what shakes just something different just to mix it up um so yeah i think watch the space for for nate jowie i don't think he's done yet let's hope not speaking of not being done yet i over the years laos i've learned to not trust your answer on this question but i'm going to ask you anyway is there any chance you're going to be suiting up again for the cairns marlins in the nbl1 north competition Chris, you're, you're really breaking up. I, I, I can't quite... Uh, is it, was it audio? No. Uh, look, I, I told the club that, you know, I, I'm, I've got a lot of things on at the moment. Like, I'm just finishing a digital diploma, um, of, a diploma of digital media, so I'm studying for two subjects. I'm doing a filming, got a, a, a contact with Ken Speedway, filming all the races here as events. So this is my career after basketball, right? Sort of media and filming and all that kind of stuff. So I've got a lot on the, on the plate, uh, especially with that study as well. And obviously... Still trying to do my job at Ken Frost Homes, um, you know, the land developer. It's, you know, that's my nine to five. So a lot on the plate, really. I can't really lift my head to exhale until sort of mid June. Also, I have a now you take, take out of that what you will, but uh, I, I'm definitely not available until <laughs> until I lift my head up for air. So um, you know, so watch the watch the space, but don't watch it too closely. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bowser! If history tells us anything, you'll be in that uniform pretty soon and catching some of those passes from from Ben Eyre before this season's over, so we'll keep our eyes out for that. But as always, Lowes, appreciate your time. It's been a lot of ha- lot of fun having you as part of the show this year, and we look forward to doing it again next year, and we'll be in touch in, in October, and we'll be all up and going once again. Yeah, Pike, you look great Great to be on the show, mate, and great to see what you're doing in this space. Uh, I think it's great that you've sort of gone around the league a bit more broad now, and, and uh, I like the, the quality of the content, and, and great to catch Cody as well and your other... Uh, co host as well throughout the year and, and love to be, be, be back next year. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Laos. Thanks, Laos. Okay, Cody, back on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. That was good fun catching up with Lowes and loves to chat, doesn't he? He does. No, it's good. It's great. And, you know, just just listening to him talk there is uh, is all the more reason why we were pushing for him to, to be on the uh, on the TV screens. And, look, you know, he was around the league for a long time and, and he's, he's full of knowledge and um, full of excitement and uh, it's always good talking to him. No, absolutely, yep. He's a... He's one of my favourites. I've known him for a long time now. It's scary to think how long <laughs> I've known him and the fact that I saw his entire NBL career. I was there from the start in Perth and I was there to help him announce his retirement in Cairns as well and, and to sign off there. So Lousy out. Lousy out. He, he did the mic drop. Loved it. <laughs> Loved it. Uh, um, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a character, but he knows his basketball as well. Yeah. He's got a great basketball mind and he's got a lot on his plate, as he talked about as well. Yeah. But we'll keep moving, Cody. Let's wrap up things here on our season of... Hoop 7's basketball hustle by looking ahead. So the NBL free agency is officially going to start later this week. Mm-hmm. There's been some movement already, so some clubs have moved quickly to re-sign some players. I'll run through some names and you might be able to just give me your quick thoughts on some of them that stand out. So mm-hmm. Sunday Detch and Hiram Harris staying in Adelaide. Nathan Sobey re-signed in Brisbane, as we talked about with Lowe's Paul Kowal and Keanu Pinder staying in Cairns. Brad Newley, who you'd written off as moving into retirement a few weeks back. Cody, he's staying mm-hmm. in, with Melbourne United for another season. Tom Abercrombie, I think he deserves a season back in, yep. in Auckland to play at least one more year at the Breakers. Sam Timmons staying with the Breakers as well. Majuk Majuk re-signed with the Wildcats. Mitch Creek resisted the temptation, I think, to go to Europe. He's staying at the Phoenix. Angus Glover, a championship winner, is staying at the Kings. Anyone jump out from that list to you, Cody? Um, look, not necessarily. I think Creek staying is is, is probably good for the Phoenix. Mm. Um, I thought he might have tested the waters over yeah. over um, in Europe possibly, but I'm sure they were probably they probably jumped all over it and threw the house at him to stay. Um, Newell's, yeah. Look again, 
you know, that's something that, like, like Lousy mentioned, you know, you kind of get a sense of when your time's up and, you know, similar to Nate in Newell's obviously feels like he's still got some K's on his legs, which is, which is fine. And someone like Newley on a, on a team that is, is fairly um, stacked is good for, I guess, settling, settling the group. I think um, just that leadership is good for them. I don't mean this to sound negative, but does that potentially mean that you wouldn't look to bring back Dave Barlow? Do you potentially not need both of them moving forward? Yeah, look, I, I don't think you need both of them. Not sure what's going to happen with Barlow. Again, another guy that's, that's getting on um, in his career and he's always on the sidelines stretching, so he, he, he keeps his body in great nick, yeah. so I, I don't know what's going to happen. But you wouldn't think that you would bring both of them back. Mm. But again, you never know. Again, it's it's one of those things that having that uh, old head on the team is is a good thing sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Um, before I run through some of the bigger free agents on the list, Cody, mm-hmm. the two that jump out in terms of getting an immediate potential opportunity in the NBA would be Xavier Cooks and Joe Luala Chul. What do you think about their prospects of you know, this time next year being in the NBA? Oh, look, I think they'll certainly get a look in after, after what they both produced this season. And again, it wouldn't surprise me if they were on rosters, but um, yeah, no, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, um, they'll obviously go to Summer League and, and play in there. Uh, I'll, I'll, be very, uh, I'll be very surprised if we see both of them back in the NBL. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let me put it another way. If they're not in the NBA, would they be both? back in the NBL, or would you advise them to look elsewhere potentially? Look, I, I think the NBL is now one of the better leagues in the world, especially from, you know, all eyes on it, yeah. I think. I also think the playing style is probably easier to adapt from the NBL to the NBA than from Europe to the NBA. Oh, for sure. And just living in general. It's an English-speaking yeah, country. Sure. Lots of guys don't like going to the European countries because they don't speak the language and they, they kind of feel a bit lost. Yep. Um, so I think the NBL is such a good um, such a good league to, I guess, stamp your authority on and, and try and make that NBA jump. No, it's going to be an interesting couple of months ahead. It will be. Okay, let's get through some names that jumped out at me who are free agents right now, Cody. And I want to get your thoughts here. If in your mind, they stay where they are, they go to another NBL club, they leave the NBL, or potentially in a couple of cases, they might even retire. So mm-hmm. you can go, you can give me a one word answer, or you can go in as depth as you like. It's <laughs> yep. up to you. Yep. That's starting Adelaide. Um, Cam Bairstow. Yeah, tough one. Um, I thought he was awesome uh, for Adelaide when he was on the court, yep. but then just couldn't stay on the court. Yep. Um, and that's been his issue, is, is his health. So look, I mean, he's one of those guys that. I mean, he ends up missing ten games at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and he's one of those guys that he's going to produce when he's on the floor for you. But how long are you going to have him on the floor? So that's a tough one. I'm not sure. Look, I'm sure. I'm sure Adelaide will probably want him around and and just try keep him healthy. Mm-hmm. Whether that's you you limit his load during the season. Um, with workouts and, and training, or I'm not sure what you do, yeah. but uh, I think the fact that he was so good for them when he was there, I, I think they'd probably go after him again. I think the plan was for him to have less of a workload if this man stayed healthy as well. Isaac yeah. Humphreys. Yeah, um, a tough one. I don't know if they'll try sign him again. I'm not sure. Um, it's not a big deal. Well, that's what I was going to say. He was he was on a lot of money. Yeah. Um, You'd almost have to, yeah. Look, I, I'm not sure what they're going to do with him. That's that's a tough one. And then if another club, you know, wants to wants to throw some money at him, you, you never know. Because um, again, health is just a massive thing. It, it's I mean, it's he, huge. He's an MVP level player. Yeah, but he's not that if he's on the sidelines. No, and this league isn't. There isn't enough games in this league that you can miss 10, 11, yeah. 12 games and it not be, it not affect the club that much. That's that's enough for your season to be written off. Mm-hmm. And with guys of this caliber, do you roll the dice? Do you not? I think that's, you know, it's up to the club. And I guess how he's acted and how he's treated his rehab and all that sort of stuff, I think that all comes into play as well. 
Maybe he doesn't need to do too many more concerts either. <laughs> Anthony Drimmick from Brisbane. Yeah, look, I think I think Brisbane should try keep him. Mm-hmm. You know, he he had a disrupted pre season or off season. He had surgery on yeah, his, on his ankle. ankle. Yeah. yeah, and he he just never got right. He never got right. And Drim is one of those guys that is a big energy guy, mm-hmm. big confidence guy, and obviously with very little preparation for this season, he just never got into a rhythm. I, if I was Brisbane, I'd be going after him for sure. Yep. On the back of talking to Lowell's, yep. we've got a little bit more insight into to Nate Jarwai's future, I think. I mean, clearly if he plays in the NBL, it's only going to be in Kansas. He's got such a footprint in the community. Do you give him another contract if you're the tight ends? Oh, yeah, I think I would. Um, with that young core that they're going to have, um, I think someone like Nate to help talk through um, the young guys and just that experience, I think, is huge. Um, can kind of be that bit of a bridge between the coaching staff and the playing group as well. Um, I think that's fairly important. Obviously, Nate's not ready to hang him up, and that's, that's fine. I, I still think we've seen a fairly fit Nate in the past couple of years, and it's, it's been good to see. Um, yeah, look, I, I think they should definitely try try get his signature. Yep, I hope so too. And I think Pinder staying actually helps because they yep. they have developed a really close bond as well, and, mm-hmm. and I, I think that'll help. One of their teammates, Court Noy. It's a tough one. I'm not um, not really sure what they what they should do with this one. Um, fairly up and down season, was hurt a bit. Came in, had some games where he'd hit some shots, but then didn't do. Much else, and then I think he was healthy towards the end and just wasn't just didn't, part of the rotation. Yeah, didn't really get into that rotation. Um, and again, he's another big confidence guy. Once he sees one or two go through, like he can catch fire real quick. But does he fit in Forty's kind of system? I don't think he does. Um, I have no doubt he'll get cans move him on. I have no doubt he'll pick up a contract at, at another club though. Yeah, I get a feeling it might be best for both parties to just agree to, mm-hmm. to go there yep. their separate ways. Another interesting one because he had his moments, but then he also had his moments where he didn't get any court time at all in Illawarra. Mm-hmm. Um, Harry Froley. Big Harry, I know. It's um it's been a frustrating one, um, from the outside looking in. I'm sure it's been frustrating for him as well. Um, you know, I think he kind of went to the Hawks. Similar to, to I did is that kind of last effort to to stay in the league and he came out and had some really good games and then would just fall out of the rotation and then come in a little bit, play some games here and there and then fall back out of the rotation. In fairness, Gorge's rotation ended up being about six or seven players. So yeah. it's, it's tough to crack that and I understand that. He's good enough to play in the league. I think he's good enough yeah. to play in the league. So again, another one that I think the club will probably part ways with him. Mm-hmm. But... Someone will pick him up. I, th- I think he's, he's, he's too good not to be in the league. Playing in Tasmania right now in the NBL 1, I wonder if the Jack Jumpers jump on him. There you go. There you go. Certainly could have used the big body. <laughs> they could have. One of his teammates in Illawarra, Dorp Reith. Oh, you'd be throwing everything at him, mm. surely. You'd have to. He was, uh, it was so important for them. And, you know, when they'd struggle to score, he was that guy. Here, go get us a bucket, you know. So, yeah, I think... Uh, they, they need to. They, they need to be throwing everything they can at him. Um, so it's, a, it's a funny one. Once the season ended, he wasn't sure if he was still allowed to catch up for dinners with Jacob Jacobus because he wasn't signed by the Hawks anymore. Yeah, yeah. But Jacob was quick to say we can still catch up. Yeah. I'm sure he's been in his ear in trying his ear. to do everything to get him to, to want to come back. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure he has. And that's absolutely fair because he would he would be very high on the priority list, you'd, you'd imagine. We've talked about this guy a few times, so I'm interested to get your thoughts now that we've had a bit of time to reflect. Mm-hmm. Finn Delaney. He's had a down year, yeah. you know, second year, away from home, um, couldn't find a rhythm, um, and he's one of those guys that is an energy guy, mm-hmm. and he tries to play his way into a game by playing hard, and I think he kind of went too hard. You know, he was trying to play himself into it too hard, and you definitely try and sign Finn, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's tough with a lot of the uh, New Zealand boys just because of the crap they've had to go through in the past two years. Yeah. You know, similar boat, but he's not going home to New Zealand because he's not a kid. Right, player. right. But Will we'll down White? Yeah, look, I think he was not as good this year. Um, you know, 
had Peyton Siever come in and, and play play that point guard role, which McDowell White plays, and that kind of hindered him a little bit. And he had some uh, some brain fades late in the, uh, in games that probably cost him a couple of games. Um, but again, just another guy that just couldn't get into a rhythm this year. Um, I think he's he's a really good really good local that you'd, you'd mm. definitely want to pick up. Tom Blanchfield's an interesting one. Up and down season in Perth, but yep. he's still in good touch. He's gone back to, to Queensland and he had, I think, 15 points in the first quarter for Rockhampton against Kyle on, yeah. on the weekend and 38 points in his first game. So he's in good touch right now. But yeah. What do you think happens with him? Yeah, look, I, the Cats probably should go after him. I think he's just one of those guys that can, can turn a game on its head um, and, and we've seen it before. But just, you know, another year where, again, I feel like I'm repeating myself for most of these guys, but he just didn't find his rhythm. I don't know if it was the system that they were running or um, what was going on, but he wasn't the same Todd that we've we've known for the past few years. I'm sure there's teams that will be willing to throw a fair amount of money at him. Um, And it's just going to depend on which way the Cats want to go, whether they want to clear house a little bit and and start fresh or, or what the deal is. But he's someone that you would try. You would try get his signature for sure. A couple of his teammates. Firstly, Matty Hodgson. Once he got his head screwed on properly, he was really good for them. Um, you know, he obviously went through uh, that that stuff mid-season. Um, you know, he couple also of, a late sign. I felt like he didn't find his feet. No, and then he got hurt early as well. Right, right, and again, just copying what I've been saying. Just mm-hmm. didn't find that rhythm. Yeah, but um, you know, he. he He's a difference maker. Mm-hmm. He can uh, he can change a game on the defensive end. He's so long, blocks shots that you think he has absolutely no way mm-hmm. of getting to, and he'll yeah. find a way to get there. And um, reads the game well on that defensive end. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's a tough one because when you you sign Majuk, you re-sign Majuk, Majuk, which I think is a massive re-signing for mm-hmm. them. I think the Cats did a really good job of of making sure that he was back on board. I think it was a club option, mm-hmm. so. Um, that was a great choice. It'll be interesting to see what the Cats do, whether they go for an import big and have Majorkas backing them up, um, which I could, I could see happening. But he would still find a home. I, he he would, would, I think he would find a home. And, and again, something like somewhere like Tassie that could use that big body. Um, and, you know, he's a big that can run the floor really well. You know, he's, he's athletic and he, he's, um, he's good at running the floor. So... He would absolutely find a job somewhere. Um, I just don't know if it's with the Cats. No. Back to Adelaide might be a decent move for him. Yep. We know CJ Bruden pretty yep. well. And if they don't bring Humphreys back, then he might be a good fit there as well. Um, what about the captain, Jesse Wagstaff? Oh, Jess still had another good year. He still had a Jesse year, you know. I he, think he that's, If he wants to play, yeah. you let him play. Oh, 100%. He's, he's done so much for that club and the league that uh, you leave it 100% in his hands. And if he wants to come back and play... You let him. If he wants to hang him up, that's fine. Um, I think people are speculating because, you know, he didn't get the big send-off and all that sort of stuff. If it was his last year, Jesse doesn't want all he that. Doesn't want that. He doesn't want that stuff. So if anything, he's going to go off quietly into the night. And um, I, I'm not sure what he'll do. I'm not sure what he'll do. I think that, uh, you know, he, he's another one of those just ultimate professionals and get, keeps his body right and does all the right things so that he's, he's ready to go by game day and... Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It'll, it'll be very interesting. Another interesting one. I'm interested to get your thoughts on mm-hmm. on Cam Glidden. I think he needs to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I think uh, he just hasn't found his role properly mm-hmm. with with uh, with the Phoenix. Especially um, now with Simon Mitchell coming back as coach. Yeah. And, you know, it's just one of those things that you just don't fit into a system properly. Mm-hmm. It happens, you know. We, we saw how good he was when he was with Cairns. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, look, I, I think... To finish his career, he probably needs to move on somewhere else. Can you come back to Perth? Oh, no, yeah, possibly, possibly. I think, um, I think when he uh, when he left Cairns, he had an offer from Perth on the table, but uh, decided to go with with the Phoenix. Mm. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they do. They, I think he'd be a, a good pickup for Perth. He absolutely. Be, we spoke to him. I think it was the first season of the show here when Sean and myself spoke to him, and he made an interesting comment where he felt like. If he wanted to win a championship, he wanted to do it the hard way by not coming mm-hmm. to Perth because he feels like Perth wins it every year. He, <laughs> might, he might not feel like he had achieved that much or had been a bigger part of it because Perth wins with or without him. Yep. 
Yeah. Now that Perth have missed the playoffs, I wonder if that's a challenge that he might yeah. might want to take on. Put him back on the map with yeah. the hometown. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, look, I think uh, I think it would be best for him. I think uh, he would he'd probably fit into Perth well and probably help them just as that another guy that could stretch the floor. Yeah. Um, another guy you know pretty well. Whiny. Whiny, Whiny Swucker. What a, what a performance he ended up producing to be a starter on that championship team with the Kings. I'd be absolutely flabbergasted if the Kings don't bring him back. Yeah, if they don't sign him, I'll be, yeah, I will be upset. I'll mm. be very upset. Yeah. I think uh, for a guy that came in as an injury replacement mm. and, again, just someone else who, who grabbed that opportunity mm. by the horns and just, just took off. I don't think there's any chance Chase Buford wouldn't want to bring him back either. Well, no, no. And, you know, he's, he's said that in, in mm. press conferences that, you know, Wani is the he's the head of the ball on on the defensive end, and he's their leader on that end. And I think he was really good. He always got the the toughest matchup, and always held his own. Uh, yeah, I would be very surprised mm-hmm. if if they move on with him. Last one, and I deliberately haven't asked you about the imports because they're a bit of a different yeah. different story. But DJ Vasilovic, what does he do? Oh, look, I think he'll have some teams throwing some money at him. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, but. I think that uh, he fits that style of play that Chase Buford puts onto the floor. And he's probably, he could probably go to a team that he is the man and he's the go to guy and he gets 20 shots a night and, and all that. But win a championship with a club, it's hard to leave that. I, I, think, I think you could see the passion that he had for the club mm. and the city and just that whole team in general mm. had for the city yeah. of Sydney. And um, no, I, I think, again, a, another one, the club needs to needs to get his signature quick. Yeah, I think so. I, I think he, if he's in the NBA next year, I think it'll be at the Kings. Yeah. Um, I want to get your thoughts on some of the decisions of some of our younger players that have decided to nominate for the NBA draft. We mm. spoke about this um, during the season and we felt like probably most of these guys were better off having another season in the NBL just mm-hmm. to get themselves more ready. Um, I'm really happy that Ariel Hug Porty has decided to have another NBL season and stay in Melbourne. I think that's a great thing for him because I think in 12 months' time he's probably a, a top five draft pick, mm-hmm. probably just about. And if he goes now, he's probably lucky to be a top a first rounder, mm-hmm. probably. Um, I think Usman Jang and Hugo Besson from the Breakers are ready. Uh, I'm, I think they've made the right decision. I'm not quite sure about Luke Travers, Kai Soto, and Todd Dickber, though. Um, They'll all be putting their names up for the NBA draft Mm -hmm. now. What do you think of those decisions and what do you think they perhaps should have done? Yeah, look, I think, look, at the end of the season, Huck Poitty was was the best Mm. of the lot. And he's he's decided to sign back on. Um, And I think that's an amazing decision for him, especially for a young guy where you see your name's probably starting to get thrown around a little bit. That would be... At that age, that would be something that you'd want to jump out straight away. Um, but I think that's really good that he's signed back on. Um, look, I think Basson and, and Jang, probably the right decision. I yeah. think they'll probably, I think they'll probably hit the draft board come draft day. Yeah. Digbo, I don't think so. I think it's too early. I think he needed another year. He was only just starting to find his feet at the end of the very end of the late. Season. Yeah, once he got his once he got his opportunities, he was. Um, Kai Soto, again, same thing. He, you know, it was only late in the year that he started to really hit a stride. And I mean, fans MVP, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look. I just feel like physically he's just not quite ready. He's not. He's not. And he was, you know, you could you could see that even in this league. Yeah. And, you know, this league doesn't have the size that the NBA does. Travers, look, I, I think I think he had a better season last year. Than he did this year, and again, opportunity is one of those things that that you've got to grab onto. And and I don't think he quite did this year, mm. but then you got to remember how young these guys are, yeah. and how much more building they've got to do, and and growth, and you know, who knows? Lots of these guys might get drafted and then get stashed away down here anyway. Sure. Um, you never know. So yeah, no, it'll be interesting. I think uh, I think a fair few of them probably should have stayed another year. Mm. But again, draft night is a crazy night. You never know what happens. You yeah. Never know what a team needs. It's not always not always the best player left in the draft that gets drafted. It's um, it's what a team needs, and and um, you know, lots of teams try to find that diamond in the rough, and um, never know. Yeah, it'll, it'll be fascinating to see how it, how it plays out. Um, 
Before we move on from the NBL and wrapping up the season, all of the latest news, um, on our last show we had just got the news that um, Brian Gorgian was stepping down from the Hawks and Jacob Jackamas was replacing him. Mm-hmm. New Zealand Breakers have now also made a change. Yeah. Very similar. They've, got, they've appointed their assistant over the top of their head coach. So Mo, Modi Mayor will be taking over from Dan Shamir. I feel for Dan because I, I got to know him pretty well over the last couple of years and I felt like he deserved to have a normal season to coach to show what he could do. But I think it, the toll of it um, ended up taking it out on him and he just he wanted to get home. Mm-hmm. And you can't blame him for, for that at all. So no. he'll be heading home. And, and Modi will be taking over. He's a passionate passionate man on the sidelines and it'll be fascinating to see how it plays out. What was your reaction to, to that news? Yeah, no, look, I think, uh, I think you're right. I'm disappointed that he didn't get a proper season under his belt. But you're right, you know, two seasons away would, would certainly take a toll. And, uh, yeah, if, if, we thought, uh, if we thought Shamir was, <laughs> was uh, you know, running up and down the sidelines like a crazy man, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what Modi does because yes. uh, he, was, he was up there a lot. He was upstanding and screaming and shouting a lot yep. um, as an assistant. And <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sure he got told on more than one occasion to, to sit down. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens when he's got free reign of the <laughs> sideline. Yeah, it'll certainly not be boring watching a Breakers game now next season, so we'll, we'll follow that closely as well. But a lot to, to have got through there, Cody. Before we wrap up the show and wrap up this season here on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle, I want to get your thoughts on how your NBL 1 West season's going, the Warwick Senators, and how you see it playing out. Because by the time we come back, you might have a championship under your belt again. <laughs> Who knows, man? Long season. Um, no, nah, look, I think... Um, I think we've certainly got a roster to, to push for that. Um, I mean, we haven't <laughs> we haven't had one game with our full roster yet, mm. though, and we're in we're in round six already. Yes. So, look, I think the longer the season goes on, we'll we'll slowly get into that, and uh, hopefully, we can start hitting our stride later in the season. Mm. Um, like I said, I think we've we've certainly got the roster and, and the coaching staff and and all that to to push for a championship. So. Um, yeah, look, exciting, exciting season ahead, and, and hopefully we can uh, get everyone on board and, and some healthy bodies, and people stop going away for weddings, including <laughs> myself. Yeah, um, so yeah, look, I'm, I'm I'm excited for for what's ahead. You've got a good experience call at your team there at the centres mm-hmm. with yourself and Caleb Davis and Ash Litterick and Corbin Rowe, yeah. a couple of exciting young players as well. And I want to give give you the chance to give them a shout out too because. Certainly in that win you had a couple of weeks ago over the Perry Lakes Hawks, it was two of your younger guys that, even though you had a massive overtime period yourself, mm, yeah. two of your younger guys really stepped up. Oh, absolutely. You know, we've uh, obviously got Kyle Zunick in. Yeah. Um, everyone in, in Perth will know, know Zoo. Um, so he's a massive in for us. But the young guys, um, George Pell mm. is, is going to be massive for us. Young kid that's just grown just ridiculously in the past 12 months. Um, you know, um, he's one of those guys that doesn't get out of second gear but still somehow does what he does and it's really good. But, but the one for me is Tyler Shand. And I think that, uh, you know, I coached him in D-League last year and he was awesome. He was awesome for us. He was just, um, he flies around the court. He understands the game really well. He's, uh, he's a stick, so we need to put some weight on him. But he's so athletic and um, he's one of the best shot blockers from um, just being right in front of you. So shooting jump shots, he just times it so well, reads it so well. Um, he, he turned that Willow game on its head and he was, he was a massive reason as to why we got back into the game. Yeah. So very exciting, very exciting young, young, uh, young boys coming up. And, you know, there's, there's lots of guys that uh, in the D-League now that uh, you'll, you'll be hearing from probably later in the next couple of years, I think. Now, I'll put you on the spot. Do you have enough free reign to finish off our show here this season to announce a potential signing for the rest of the season for the Senators? Oh, no. No, no. no. Right. I, I think we're still trying to figure <laughs> figure some stuff out. But, uh, no, nah, look, I like I said, if, if the roster we have is, is what we finish the season with, I still think we're, we're a good, good chance. Um, but, you know... Uh, I think there's a couple of people that we're we're talking to and, and trying to trying to just bolster our bench a little bit. Right, but we'll, um, we'll, we'll keep our eyes <laughs> yeah, for, yeah. for the rosters each night and see sure. if somebody pops up, Cody. <laughs> um, just quickly across the league, there's some there's some incredible talent in the competition right now. Do yeah. you, is there anyone that jump, jumps out at you that you've played against or seen that 
he's ready for the NBL. We know what Devondre Walker Devondre Walker, yeah. <laughs> at, at Rockingham, he's been incredible. But you yeah. had a good look at a couple of guys up in Kalgoorlie on the weekend. Yep. Um, you know, we've still got Jeremy Grace running around. Mm-hmm. There's some exciting talent right across the board. Is there anyone that's really jumping out? Uh, it's tough to tell this early in the season. I mean, I know we're in round six, but obviously haven't seen everyone in person. Mm-hmm. Um, and guys have been in and out, COVID and all that sort of fun stuff. So... Um, tough to tell right now, but look, there is uh, there is as much talent over here in the NBL One West as, as in any league in the country. So, um, look, I, I really think that there is going to be some eyes uh, on this league, and and there's certainly some young guys that are pushing pushing for some spots, and and that's awesome. It's great, and obviously guys like Devondre Walker, who are just an absolute walking bucket, and yes. is proving that <laughs> week in and week out. It's uh, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's a lot of fun. All right, Cody, we'll keep an eye out on how the rest of that season goes and we might come back a couple of times between now and, and probably September as we roll up for the NBL season to do a, a bonus episode or two just to keep an eye on your mm-hmm. your progress. But um, as we wrap things up now for this season, it obviously has ended a lot differently than it started when I had yeah. Damien Martin <laughs> over, over beside me, but I'm, I'm delighted with the way things have turned out and thank you to Hoop7 for continuing to make this show possible and, and thank you to you, Cody, for being happy to jump on board and I've had a lot of fun doing this show with you and I hope to be able to continue with you moving forward that's obviously something that you have an off season to think mm-hmm. about now yeah. you can come back with your your demands moving forward <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on board thank you to Tap Touch for helping us bring the Tap Touch previews with Maddie Knight as well um, when we were able to, to do those and thank you for their support you know Hoop7 have just made this show possible for three years now and I couldn't be more thankful but um more than anything, I'm just appreciative of people listening in to mm. us, us talk basketball, Cody. Yeah. So that's always a little bit humbling for me to know that people might actually be listening to anything that, that I have to say. But I appreciate everyone that does tune in and for their ongoing support. And I'll wrap things up now for, for this season. Congratulations to the Sydney Kings for the NBL Championship. And I'll let Cody have the final words for, for this, this season. Yeah, look, obviously a massive, massive thanks to Hoops Heaven and Tab Touch for... Uh, making this possible um, it's, it's really good and lots of time goes into it from uh, from your side so that's that's amazing and you do uh, you definitely do uh, unreal work putting the show together mate so uh, look I really appreciate you thinking of me and, and uh, bringing me on board and I'm glad that uh, I jumped at the opportunity because it's been a lot of fun it's been a lot of fun and uh, yeah look thank you to all the listeners that uh, keep it going as well and um, no I look forward to uh, con- continuing to do it with you mate so uh, yeah thanks a lot